insurance company was given them enough money to treat uh, acute health care. Uh, there have been other court cases, so there's a lot of lot of you know, a lot of noise in that sector. So that would be point one. You can you can also overlook for uh, point two, a bit provocative, and I'll go into that a bit. What I mean, I'm not sure if HDA always is uh, the answer. Um, I think I already made, made, made that point a bit. Three, uh, then you should come with you know certain alternative if you make such a claim. And I think uh, uh, in mental health care in the Netherlands, but also in other countries, I guess, uh, we tend to overlook two uh, important points. One is the point of comorbidity. Uh, 20 years less, uh, you already mentioned, 20 years less of life expectancy for severe mental illness, mostly because of somatic uh, diseases. The other one, I would say, is the administrative expenses. I will bring up the argument that it's way over 50% in the Netherlands. And I think simply think that, you know, that's too much. Okay. Um, so to start off a bit, I mean, you see this actually, we are, this, 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 this one here, this is multi but You see it's still a well-funded uh, system. These are percentages of the total. Check with public, of course, is, is not expected, of course, but you are much more uh, uh, on the right. Uh, and I'm not sure actually what, you know, what exactly what the issue is. But the point is we're still well-funded. Then about the system. I, I think we come from a situation which uh, UK people uh, used to say splendid isolation. So mental health was a world by its own, with their own research institutes, with their own laws, with their own everything. Splendid isolation, and it worked actually quite okay. And, and, and that world has changed over the last decade or so. So we have to give you an idea around for the basic services, 6,000 professionals, 290 providers who do specialist services, 290 providers who do something which we call long-term care mental health, around 4,000 self-employed psychiatrists. Uh, so big, a big, uh, big sector actually. I think total expenses are slightly above 4 billion annually. Um, we witness many new entrants over the past decade, uh, so doing like specific counseling services, e-therapy, often a kind of, you know, super regional, uh, uh, super regional uh, services. Now, starting in 2008, uh, mental health entered our uh, managed competition uh, kind of surround a lot, largely, uh, with the exception of long-term, uh, uh, long-stay uh, hospitalization, and in, in 2016, the psychiatrists of children, social care, sheltered living, living went to the municipalities. So now we have four big, actually five big financial pieces. So light blue is acute care. Uh, the purple one is the long-term uh, mental health. The 14% is youth, 23 is sheltered living, and then there's additional streams for uh, forensic uh, care, which is being provided by the uh, Justice Department uh, uh, currently. Um, I think at the time, one thing was, and I think that's, that's more important than currently be mentioned, that at the time, you know, why, why mental health went from this world of its own, this splendid isolation, you know, to all these different kind of subsystems with all these different kinds of uh, legalizations and, and logic, etc., etc., of the fact that many psychiatrists uh, always had in the Netherlands the idea that they were like normal doctors, like doctors in normal hospitals, somatic disease. So they also thought, you know, we want to be in the system that steers hospital care, primary care. Uh, so that's always been an underlying uh, sentiment of. of that profession in, in the Netherlands, you know, to really uh, match themselves with, with, say, regular somatic uh, physicians, you know, that, that's, uh, that's one thing. And I think the other thing was that at that, that time, the uh, associations were thinking that if they would move to a competition environment, they would get more money. Uh, and I think both, both things basically didn't happen. Um, but at the time, I think those was many, this was kind of underlying, underlying logic. 
We have still a rather large innovation sector compared to, mo to mo many other countries. And we saw we witnessed many kind of policy experiments. And I will go quickly to a couple of them you know, from the idea of prioritizing, uh, prioritizing care. Okay, so we can, uh, we can prioritize in many ways. Uh, cost sharing, benefit basket, strategic purchasing, competition, of course, and we did actually basically all of them. Uh, so we have some uh, natural experiments uh, to see you know, what uh, came out of it. I mean, all of them, I mean, we did all of them in, in, uh, in mental health care. Um, so um, I was involved in a study which has been published, I think, two years ago. Uh, and it was uh, a cost sharing experiment we had in 2012. At that time, it was being decided, 2012 is a very important year. It was actually the first year in the Netherlands where the fiscal measures of the post-crisis uh, uh, situation really entered into the public uh, into the public sector before that it was more expansory budgeting system. 2012 was really a big hit and, and mental health care was actually right in front of that hit. Um, so, so there was co-payment introduced of 200 euros only for specialist mental health. It basically meant you had to pay 200 euros. And we uh, did a, a time series analysis and you see some of the results here. Uh, we witnessed a 20% drop in demand. 20%. To give you an idea, schizophrenia was around 11. Uh, the drop was higher in low-income people than it was among high-income people. What was expected, what you would expect as an economist, because you know price elasticity is much higher in mental health than it is uh, in certain other uh, stuff. So, so, but okay, you could say, okay, so 20%, you know, we wanted a reduction of, uh, of money, so, you know, we are very successful. Actually, somebody asked me at the time, what should we tell, what should we tell Parliament? <laughs> I said, if this is what we wanted, we did a very good job. But 20%, of course, not that good. Um, we also witnessed a 20% increase in crisis mental health DRGs. And we witnessed an 80% increase in a subpopulation of involuntary admissions in mental health. Which, of course, brought in additional costs because judges, you know, had to, had to tell things about it. So this is actually, and, and, and the cost went down a bit, but not so much. Actually, if you look at it, when it went down with 6%. But for the 6%, we treated 20% uh, less patients. And uh, we have a problem now in the Netherlands. We used to be, I would say, on top of that there were very, not much people with you no know, living unsheltered around, but this really has changed over the last year or so. And this is somehow, somehow where it might have started. Now, what the providers did, uh, this is a very recent study, they simply treated their patients longer. Because if you have 20% less patients, you have time on Friday, right? Being a bit provocative here. And we see again how the budgeted providers, so these are the regular, normal providers, how they increase the uh, length of, uh, of uh, treatment. And we see less with the non-budgeted providers, which are the new uh, entrants in area. So, to sum up, to sum up, um, this was, of course, not a very good Experience, I would say, and I actually bless the political system because they were able, and I think that's a real political, I mean, it's politically very, very, very rare, they were able to, to, to terminate this in one year. So I always tell people, you know, if you can stop politically with something that's bad, bless that kind of government. Uh, because it's not always happening. Now, the um, uh, providers could do uh, treating patients more longer because our specific payment system we're now trying to get to the UK system but I just understand that it's all, all totally implemented uh, we also delayed by the way for three or four years so we're still stuck with a DRG uh, based system which is diagnosis related and the providers can decide how long it will take and you see that there are different different cases and these are 
the thresholds of the different remunerations. And just after a remuneration, you see a peak in the number of treatments, which kind of gives you the idea that you can upcode the system, that if you can, you know, if you can, uh, you're allowed to do 1,000 minutes, you do 1,050 minutes, and you get a DRG 1,000 to 2,000 minutes, so that's very good. You can also do all kind of interesting and very important, I would say, economic uh, 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 calculations. You can make a, a distinction between extrinsically motivated physicians and intrinsically motivated physicians, meaning you can make separations between those who uh, seem to gain the system more than others. And you see, actually, if you have the intrinsic, this is the dark gray, you see, we have quite a bit of extrinsic motivated uh, uh, people in, 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 in the mental, mental health. So, but this made it possible that, that the uh, providers could more or less uh, reject, uh, react to the uh, decline, declines in the <coughs> of, the, of this one time of COVID. So I would say strategy one of, of um, prioritization, co-payments, not a good idea. Then we go to strategy two, which is managed competition, restructuring, provider landscape, etc., etc., etc. And we witnessed many, many, many uh, shocks between 2008, when uh, mental health uh, more or less came into the health insurance laws or managed competition, was carved in, by the way, to uh, make a US uh, kind of alignment where they talk about carving out mental health of managed care plans. We carved them in, and it led to 1.1 billion euros additional costs from 3 to 3.4.1. So that's a lot. Official evaluation with, with our central uh, planning office. Uh, by the way, 500 million was one of cost, so 600 million structural costs. So of course, at that time, the idea politically was, oh, no, that's, it's a one way, uh, one way, uh, 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 this is a one off, um, uh, say, uh, uh, reform. But it carried on, and I just have a couple of them risk based capital investment and inserted to the need regulations in 2009, making sure that the, health, uh, that the mental health providers now had to go to the banks instead of to the government to get money for investment. The co payments I just discussed only one year. Covenants, we, uh, the ministry did with the entire sector, create less money and also the idea that the number of beds should be reduced by 30%. So increasingly very, very strong incentives, also if you, if you compare it to uh, uh, somatic. Uh, somatic. <coughs> uh, we ended public underwriter, the public underwriting of insurance risk, I mean insurance get a risk adjustment. But there were lots of uh, lots of safety nets underneath, and those have been, you know, stopped in mental health between 2012 and 2017. Meaning, for a general insurance company, that a single euro is a single euro. Before a single euro would be something like 10 cents, you know. So it really increased the uh, level of risk they they face. Now the payments uh, were based on the AGs. I just said something about the incentives uh, uh, this slide before. And uh, to kind of uh, stimulate the, 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 the uh, 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 trans substitution from inpatient to outpatient care, we introduced basic mental health care, which is kind of something between specialist care and primary care in community mental, mental health centers in 2014. Now in 2015, but still the ministry wasn't done, we increased the Social Care Act, which uh, uh, if the municipalities, I think, around 7 billion euros to do a lot of stuff with a reduction of the budget of something like 10%, but they would be able to do it better, that was the idea. And they also, and this also included uh, psychiatry for children, guidance for, for people with severe mental health disorders, sheltered living, and the forensic care of the justice department. So we really did a lot of reforms. And the thing, of course, is can we, can we really, uh, uh, was, it, was it very successful? Now, uh, if you look at the mental health care sector by itself, 
you see three periods in the Netherlands. These are different types of providers. Uh, so this is, for example, psychiatric psychiatric hospitals, these are outpatient clinics. So we have a couple of different ones, but you see actually at the Dutch mental health care, this is the integrated, we do everything mental health provider, which went up quite drastically in the 1990s. So this was the creation of big providers who did everything from severe mental illness to, uh, to common mental uh, disorders, uh, inpatient, outpatient, uh, forensic, everything, basically. And uh, this, was, this was actually the splendid isolation of the mental health care sector. We did all the all-in-one kind of... And because of the competition, I would say, also because of the competition, I would say, this kind of started to split up in, say, the last 10 years. You know, the, the, the force of the integrated providers has become less. All kind of small-scale providers have grown and, and, and have uh, created uh, business models uh, of their own. Now, um, that led to, I would say, substantial financial dis... No, sorry, uh, uh, fi substantial financial dis... This is, this is some of the current statistics of the Dutch mental health. So this was last week, you cannot read this, but it says financial emergency in mental health leads to a cascade of uh, uh, legal cases. This is one provider uh, bringing the Department of Justice to court because they pay not enough for uh, forensic care. 10 percent. And there are many, there are many, there are, there are more, there are more of this case. This is really, this is what you have in the private system, of course. You not always go to government. <laughs> if it's private, you simply sue. But that's, that's of course, you know, if you Private system. So, so you went to court, and uh, and this is this is very uncommon, but it's uh, it's happening in, in many countries. Now, if you look at uh, employee satisfaction, you see it's going down uh, in mental health care. Uh, so, employee satisfaction, of course, very important. Uh, and you see how even over the last decade or so, it went down from 83 percent to 65 percent, and actually. You know, quite some people are leaving, psychiatrists are leaving, nurses are leaving, and then they are rehired, but they get a, 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 a wage raise of 50% or so, because it's much more expensive if you're self-employed, uh, um, say, business set up person. Now, if you look at the amount of money, mental health is the blue line, and you see it, 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 uh, it, it, it goes less, uh, it's less than, than the purple line, which is total health care. So you see the amount of growth in mental health is um, uh, significantly under uh, growth of total health care expense. That might not be that far off from the UK, by the way, if I uh, saw those, uh, those statistics. We have now underspending for the last three, four, five years in mental health, annual underspending of around 200 million euros. That means the money is allowed to be spent by the government. But it is not being spent by the providers because of the negotiations between the insurance companies and the mental health providers. And simply the insurance companies uh, don't give a lot of money. So what happens, these are the fixed assets, but the fixed assets of the mental health providers are declining, meaning that they are eating up their own uh, uh, capital. If you're optimist, you would say this is what happens if you go more community care, but at least the money is being, uh, the number of fixed assets is declining. Now, these are, these are the contracts. And you see, these are the non-contracted providers. So those who don't have a contract with an insurance company. On a Dutch law, you can still then, you know, operate. Uh, they even have to pay you, because we also have freedom of choice. So we have this strange thing in the, in the law, which says we have selective purchasing, networks, manage competition, so insurance companies steer you, and at the same time we have freedom of choice. So how do you solve that conundrum? conundrum? You go to court, it's a private system, and the judges have said that, you know, we consider something, uh, we consider a certain service as freedom of choice if the co-payment is not higher than 20%. Meaning that the insurance company always has to pay 
80% even if you go to a non-contracted provider. And you see actually, uh, this, is, this is not the same, well, of course, same amount of money, but you see in one year time the um, uh, number of non-contracted providers, the budgets, have gone up at 17%. Now that's a rise, of course. But if you look at the contracted, so the main, the very main kind of bread and butter mental health is 2.3. But this includes inflation, of course, so that means it's zero minus something uh, in real life. And you see, actually, this is from a certain study, a uh, qualitative study, where a provider said there are no clear protocols for contract. Every health insurer has its own rules and processes. We have 10 of them. Uh, it's very hard to see the forest through the trees. So especially small providers just choose to treat. And they often treat, of course, common mental disorders, you know, less. So there's also a thing of, uh, of uh, cherry picking here. And insurance companies, of course, are, are claiming that you know, this is very bad for quality of care because uh, this is cherry picking and it's over the uh, treatment, etc., etc., etc. But so this is um, what's going on. So I would say strategy two is also quite difficult. Strategy three, benefit reductions. Uh, HDA and so, benefit package and so. 2012 was again a triple hit year, so we also excluded certain uh, treatments from the uh, public benefit basket. But only real time was really being so excluded. Uh, there was exclusion of adjustment disorders. There was the uh, number of uh, first echelon psycho psychologists, only allowed five before it was eight. Excluding of sleeping pills, other sedatives from the benefit basket, also one today, HDHD medicine. Uh, and of course, because that was happened before, we have excluded all therapies that's related to work or intimate relationships, people were divorcing, etc. Et so that was 2012. It was actually only, I'm not really sure if there was a real HDA framework underneath. It was largely being done because of the stress of. Uh, uh, the austerity uh, policies and, 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 and how quick you know you simply need to find to find them. Okay, so how is this in the Netherlands? So we have some kind of official, nice kind type of uh, system, but not but not as, uh, as as formal. Uh, so there is an institution, the Dutch Health Institute, that advises the Ministry of Health. And they use these kind of thresholds. Now the interesting thing is, and I'll sometimes tell that to people in, in, in lectures, that this is the only numbers we have in Dutch healthcare that are not adjusted or indexed for inflation. I mean, they, they, they have been around since 2006, so they are 13 years now and they're still the same. So I used to say, uh, especially pharmaceutical companies like such a statement, so at that time it was 80,000 euros for quality and it's still 80,000 euros for fall. But we also adjust them to the burden of illness. So which actually means if you look at severe mental disorders, they would have something like 0 0.9. Uh, so that means for severe mental disorders, say schizophrenia or something like that, you can spend maybe 70,000 euros. Uh, and if you have low back pain or something like that, you can spend less. But the idea is that, that, that if you have a higher uh, uh, burden of disease, that we will pay, that we will pay more. In the burden of diseases, sorry, the disability <laughs> way. Disability. The disability way. Yeah. 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 So we simply say in normal language, we pay more if you have a severe disease, if you have schizophrenia or terminal cancer, than if your toenail is not okay. Uh, so that's a threshold, that, but but for mental health they don't have a really big, they don't have a really big impact, especially of course pharmaceuticals. But there are not that many uh, pharmaceuticals uh, coming uh, coming around. Now we also did another study uh, a couple of years ago, and we looked at the general assessment framework, so the GAF scores. And the idea of this study is, um, uh, would it be able? That has been discussed. You know, can we stable patients or those the the general assessment framework score increase. So we have 300,000 Dutch people, I believe, and uh, we have diagnosis, and we have the uh, general assessment framework score, and we can kind of plot them all the time. And what then you really see is that 
we uh, get effects, but this is of course all correlations, associations, this is non causal, that the effects are declining over time and that they are much lower with schizophrenia than they are, for example, with depression or with anxiety or obsessive compulsory uh, kind of uh, diseases. Um, now, I'm not sure uh, if, if, I mean, this might be very good, you know, to stable it, but politically, it's of course not a good message. I mean, politically, you know, if you, if you have to say on, on national television, hey, I'm investing a huge amount of money here in schizophrenia, but guess what? It would be much worse if I didn't do it. It's stable now. It's, you know, people want to see breakthrough. Uh, so I guess in that sense, you know, it's one of, because of course, theoretically, you could say, these are young people, many years ahead, huge burden of disease, huge social costs, huge external effects. So this is a very clear case. And then still it's not done. Still you see all these measures coming down in a sector where actually you could say, hey, this might be much more rational to invest in this than say in terminal cancer or dementia or certain other uh, kind of stuff. But it's not, it's not happening. Yes, simply, at least not in. So that brings me up to a couple of uh, points before I end up with um, my two uh, takeaways. So did we see any progress? I think a couple of more theoretical phrases. So one is the 20% people, which in every country, we cannot and we should not treat the 20% who struggles with mental health. So we have in the Netherlands, I think, spare capacity of uh, your own, 10. We can treat 10%. Yeah, probably 10%. So we can treat 50%. But it also means that, you know, things are not going tremendously wrong if we don't treat substantial amounts of people. Then, of course, which I really like is the old old phrase, and I think it's very true in mental health of Richard Frank and Thomas McGuire. Mental health economics is like health economics, only more so. Uh, meaning, from my perspective, that the force of the incentives is much stronger. And I, I like to bring to fore that, that what we just witnessed in the strong force of, maybe too strong force of incentive, which is also a problem. Especially if you kind of compare uh, the, the, the managed competition and the out of pocket pay and the benefit reduction, all these things uh, together. Now, of course, the OECD recently brought up a report and they framed it like this the economic burden of mental health is up to 4%, which is probably, of course, true, I assume, but it doesn't mean that you kind of save this amount of money, not necessarily so, if you spend, say, 4%, if you spend, of course, 1%, that was the phrase, you know, we only spend 1% and see here you have 4%, but you cannot probably get, because we have, of course, transaction costs. And the big problem is that nobody believes that if you save something in this area, you know, it gets, up on top, it gets out of the other side. I mean, that's what our scoring agencies simply do not do not uh, uh, kind of stake. I mean, if I give them these these calculations, I say, hey, you should invest, or prevention is basically the same, because if you should invest, uh, they will say, oh, no, no, uh, maybe, maybe I should invest, but, you know, the hospitals will not spend less. You know, so that's, that's uh, of course, a political problem. So I think, you know, prioritization, out-of-pocket payment, bad idea. I think, uh, I didn't really, I didn't really uh, go into it, but I personally believe that good referral chains is very important, especially in such a complex kind of network uh, situation of, say, severe mental uh, uh, disorders. Um, so I, I think so that tops competition. You know? So how do we get good referral networks? Real good referral networks. And that's something different than a primary care, secondary care, tertiary care, because that's not anymore how patients walk through uh, the different systems. Now, of course, there's a lot of heterogeneity, which makes it all very uh, difficult. Um, uh, and if you look at HDA, I think, you know, it's, it's difficult to say, even, you know, all the uh, truth speaking up to power kind of arguments, but it's difficult to see, you know, how should we, uh, how should we make the case for prevention of costs if we don't do anything. It's the same with AMR. I mean, we have very bright uh, economic cases for AMR prevention. And uh, we have rather, okay, AMR uh, in the Netherlands, but it basically means that if something goes wrong, you pay. But that's not what a politician sees, you know. 
you're not going insect because you say, hey, I'm going to do something, and if I don't do it, you will be have a problem in three years. That's not how you get re-elected, basically. You know, you get re-elected if you do something on the crisis, even if you could have prevented that crisis. <laughs> so, uh, so I maybe, you know, I don't mean to be cynical, but I think, you know, simply to mean the case that you know, this is a lot about speaking through the power and how these mechanisms go. So I think a, a very big question, and, and personally, very close to my heart is, how do we protect the care for the severe mentally ill? And so these are the people with schizophrenia, with bipolar disorders, you know, really suffer, and also really suffer because of certain of the uh, uh, policy uh, that, that, you know, that, that, that we do actually. Uh, so how do, how do you do that? So to end up uh, with kind of two things, I think, it's uh, understudied, in but tend to rise in complex systems like mental health. So one, I think, uh, is administrative costs or indirect costs. These are, uh, this is the same uh, population as uh, where we had the other, uh, the other study a couple of slides ago. This is the amount of indirect time within Dutch DRGs. So that means time uh, professionals uh, use but not in direct contact with their clients. And what we see that is on average very close to 50, 40%. And we see is a big variety between the different providers. So we see a big variety in indirect time, and we see it's close to 50%. Now, if I add to that close to 50%, the cost of the insurance companies, of the Ministry of Health, of all the other bodies, uh, like we have 15 in the UK, we also have 15 or 16. <laughs> but if we, if we add all those costs, uh, and of course, of the people who are not being you know, rewarded by these amount of reimbursement, you know, I'll make the case it's 50% or more than 50%. And I would say in a system where more than 50%, that be very bold, more than 50% of expenses is not direct patient time, it's not healthy. So my first statement is, you know, we should do something in this kind of way. It's not always, of course. I mean, we need coordination, we need multidisciplinarity kind of stuff, because this is also, you know, a reflection of the things we're discussing here, you know, how do you bring those different silos together, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I, I, I still have the statement very normative. That's not helping. So, question one: How do we reduce that? You know, make direct patient time out of this uh, variety of uh, indirect time. Second, this is a work we did, and this is actually the cost of the. Uh, uh, largest Dutch health insurance company, Silver Cow, they have 3.4 million people insured. This is the number of comorbidities, and this is the amount of costs. And it goes for mental health as well. It's not about the average, it's about the tail. And we have here, we have, you see how it's growing exponentially, and over the lifetime, of course, we collect all kinds of chronic diseases, including depression and a lot of other stuff, you diabetes and depression correlates, cardiovascular depression, but now we all know that of course, but we don't make any policy on it. So my second point is, we should look where the burden of illness is, and where the money is, and that's say with the sickest one to five percent patients. And we more or less forget about the other stuff, let the professions, professionals arrange it, they're very you know, very capable of doing it. So we shouldn't intervene as policy maker, this is going well as it is. Um, so, so to end up with that kind of alternative vision, you know, what we should do, from my perspective of course, but uh, it's, you know, something in mental health with the indirect costs, and much more looking into the comorbidities, co because the splendid isolation we had in the Dutch mental health care sector, and one of the big problems with that was that it didn't really align, you know, with somatic care and comorbidities. And now we have it all splintered up, and it's still, you know, it's still the same. So, you know, I, I would say we really, you know, passed away the, the, the goal. Okay, so I'll leave it with that, I guess.